Hi, this is Paul Shepherd, and welcome to the Mindset Changing Podcast. Today, we are talking about something we don't talk about enough, and that is toilet anxiety or toilet phobia. So let's explore this a little deeper. Toilet anxiety. Even the smallest trip for some people outside can result in feeling panicky due to how anxiety can trick that person into one or more of the following. Feeling like they need the loo when they actually don't. Feeling anxious that they will be too far from a toilet and have a humiliating accident. Developing a fear of using a public toilet. Fear that others will listen and judge the natural noises that they will make if they use the bathroom in public. It goes on really, and this is a subject that gets brought up quite often by clients, and we do a variety of processes around it, because it can really be debilitating. It can really reduce your quality of life. I was recently walking with a friend of mine in Brighton, past the i360. And if you don't know what the i360 is, it's a vertical viewing tower that takes you up 450 feet into the air in a giant clear pod so you can walk around, you can have drinks and you can view Brighton from above. They have events so you can do yoga, you can do fitness, um, you can even climb down on a piece of rope. Maybe not for the faint hearted. Now, I asked my friend if they'd ever been in the I-360 and they said no. They said they were too scared to go up as it lacked a toilet. Now, the ride itself lasts about 25 minutes. And yet I keep hearing that some people won't go up as they don't want to risk being stuck and needing the bathroom. It doesn't help that when the tower first opened, it had a few teething problems and the pod got stuck, which left some people waiting a few hours, apparently, to be brought back down, which for someone with a toilet anxiety would be their worst nightmare. Now, the fact that this ride hasn't got stuck for years hasn't changed some people's minds. They don't want to take that risk. So in my mind, I'm like, yes, we should go up that tower. In their mind, they were looking at me as if to say, I don't think you're going to get me up there. I suspect it will happen. But they said to me, you should do a podcast on the subject because it's something that they find debilitating. They are in therapy and maybe their therapist will address it with them. And then later that day, I went to the cinema to see Dune, the movie, and IMAX. If you've not seen Dune, what an incredible, incredible movie. And another friend who booked the tickets made sure that they were sat in the aisle seat just in case they needed to use the loo. So out of genuine curiosity, I was asking, what's so important about sitting on the aisle seat? And for them... They didn't want to interrupt someone's viewing of the movie by going past them. And they really wanted to make sure they had easy access during the movie to just get up and go. To them, that was pretty normal. Toilet anxiety can be quite subtle, quite crafty in how it can trick you into comfort zone seeking behaviours. Toilet anxiety is actually quite common. And it's something you don't have to let ruin your life if you're struggling with it. There is help out there for you that can begin to turn it around. I really would look at someone who offers CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or like myself, I offer CBT, but I also do some other models uh, around anxiety that can really change the way that you think and feel about situations that can make you feel quite anxious. Now, I know what toilet anxiety feels like because in my 20s, I struggled 
badly with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, due to my anxiety disorder. I felt bloated. I had really bad painful cramps, um, really bad gas, and I could be hit what felt like a punch to my gut at any moment, causing me to rush to the loo. And I started to dread going out to certain public places where my anxiety could get worse as I didn't want to use the bathroom as I was terrified people could hear me and I really, really didn't want to feel any more embarrassed than I felt already. And one thing that I began to develop was the fear of fear. I would get this cold but yet hot, sweaty feeling which made my skin prick. And that usually led to a change in my gut, like a punch, a cramp, where I would need to use the bathroom. And I even dreaded going to friends' houses just in case I was hit by an attack as I didn't want to make any noises. And the bathrooms are usually next to the bedroom, which I was in with my friends, or next to the dining room if we were sat having dinner. And I would dread going just in case I needed to use the loo. And what I began to do was I used to take diarrhea tablets to avoid any need to go to the bathroom. And it kind of worked and sometimes didn't. Now, of course, the fear of fear and the worry that my IBS would kick in would make it much worse. I had no tools or strategies. I didn't really understand anxiety back then, so I had no way of managing it. So I was at its mercy, and I'd do my best to avoid any situation where there was a risk of being humiliated, embarrassed, ashamed, having an accident, being in a difficult situation. I just wasn't going to put myself through that. And back then, I was still in the mindset that anxiety was all in my head. So I was trying to solve this IBS anxiety issue through therapy, exploring, talking about it, thinking more positively. And whilst it was good to talk, I still had no idea what to do when feeling anxious about needing the bathroom. This really didn't help my social anxiety whatsoever. Now, for anyone who is new to my podcast, welcome. Um, The anxiety disorder I had only started to heal when I treated it as a physical condition and not just a mental one. And that is the way I like to work with clients. That holistic approach seems to produce much better, healthier results. So treating it physically shifted my anxiety experience and started me on the path to healing. I am so grateful that I took that approach at that time. I really felt like I was going to give up. And treating my anxiety holistically, I think, saved my life and brought me back from the edge of despair. And I know that some of you listening to this are really struggling with anxiety and anxiety will trick you into thinking you won't get better, but you can, you really can. One thing that changed when I began to heal my body was my IBS. It slowly reduced and got better. Now, I know that some foods can trigger it now and then, but I have no toilet anxiety at all. And I put that down to my body healing and reducing pressure on my nervous system and giving my body a chance to heal. When we become anxious, the body changes and it puts on the back burner any non-essential functions such as digestion, reproductive system, immune system, hormone production and tissue repair because these are not needed when we are in survival mode. Just to add to that, if you're eating whilst rushing or eating in a stress state, your body isn't prepared or 
in the right state to digest your food, which can produce bloating, heartburn, acid reflux. So just as a quick tip, make sure you're relaxed when you're eating. Don't eat on the go. You know, do a few nice big deep breaths down to the diaphragm, let it trigger the parasympathetic nervous system and let the brain know you're safe. That's the best way to eat. I know some people use gratitude to help get themselves into the right state of mind to appreciate what they're eating. I know some people do that in the form of prayer too. This can also help the mind and body slow down and then help your body get ready to digest your food optimally and not struggle with it. Now, not many people know that serotonin, which is a hormone, a neurotransmitter, and quite famous for that feel-good, content feeling that we like to get, also plays a role in how your gut works. I mean, over 93% of your serotonin is produced within the gut, and it can interact with your enteric nervous system, affecting your moods and behaviors. But it also has a role in peristaltic reflex, which is the movement of food through your gastrointestinal tract. Surprisingly, anxiety can increase the amount of serotonin in the gut, causing spasms to happen in your colon, and then cause unexpected bowel movements. So people who have too much serotonin may have IBS where it's watery and diarrhea, And if they don't have enough serotonin, they may suffer with IBS in a constipational way. Just to also add, your vagus nerve may also play a role here too, as it carries signals from the gut to the brain, and anxiety can cause issues with the vagus nerve, resulting in neurotransmitter imbalances, which are linked to gut motility. We could talk about IBS further, but I'm not going to do that today as it's a complex subject, maybe for another podcast. But if you do struggle with IBS, then it's worth seeking help because there's some great advice out there on how to manage it. Dietary wise, lifestyle wise, it's making sure you reduce anxiety surrounding it too. Now, toilet anxiety isn't just about the bowels. For my friend going up the I360, that's more about their bladder. Now, when I was really anxious, my bladder was a bit of an issue. It's a bit sensitive and it would often feel like it needed emptying. I could go to the bathroom, relieve myself, and then not long after, feel that pressure beginning to build back up in the bladder, suggesting I needed to go back again. That was so infuriating. I can't tell you. It was less embarrassing because it was just a pee, but it was more annoying than anything else. Caffeine and alcohol made this much worse, which made going out for drinks or socialising with friends quite difficult as I would often be heading off to the bathroom. And I would just laugh it off and just saying I had an old lady's bladder. Kind of became a running joke back then. But how do you know if you have toilet anxiety or toilet phobia? I mean, some people really do take it for granted that it's normal. But is it? So here are some signs that you could look out for. If you recognize them, it's always worth having a chat. Number one, do you struggle to use a public toilet for fear of being watched or judged for the natural fart or water splashes noises you may make? Number two, do you reduce fluids to reduce the need for using the bathroom when outside your home or at night? Do you panic if there is no instant access to a bathroom in a venue despite not even wanting to go? Number four. For guys, do you choose cubicles over urinals due to feeling anxious about peeing with people around you? Number five. Do you often misinterpret the feelings in your bladder and bowels due to over-focusing on them? If you focus hard enough, you can misinterpret any feeling that's happening quite naturally within your stomach, within your bowels, as a sign you need to go. Number six, 
feeling anxious if you don't have an end of row seat at the theatre whilst travelling for easy access. Number seven, feeling anxious about social activities or even cancelling plans because you don't know the toilet access situation. Number eight, planning toilet access before you go somewhere new. Looking them up on maps, seeing what shops or cafes are nearby. Where can you use that bathroom if you needed to? CBT is a wonderful way of treating toilet anxiety. It can help rewire your mind to be able to go back out without that anxiety at the forefront of your mind. And a CBT process can look like this. So any client that works with me may recognize my tact process. So tact is where you would take some paper or use a keyboard, whatever you want. And first of all, you write T for trigger. For example, going out socially and worrying what the bathroom situation would be. Then you'd write A for automatic assumptions. And this is where we treat our thoughts as reality even though they're just thoughts. And you could write down, I will need the loo and can't find one. I will be in pain. I will have an accident. I will be embarrassed. And they're assumptions because they often come with no evidence that they're going to happen. They catastrophize. They predict that you're going to be embarrassed and ashamed because anxiety knows that if you pay attention to these thoughts and treat them as reality, then you're less likely to do what is making you feel anxious. So you're going to avoidance mode and avoidance will ruin your life. So once you've written down your automatic assumptions, you write down C for consequences. And C is what happens to you when you treat your thoughts as reality, those automatic assumptions as real. So for example... What physical symptoms do you get when you focus on those thoughts? Sweating, shaking, heart racing. Do you feel anxious? Do you feel stressed? Is it making your life hell? Are you lonely, depressed? What are the full consequences? Write down as many as possible for treating your thoughts as reality. What's it doing to you? And then you move on to T. And T is truth. And it's important you begin to engage your rational brain here and start to rewire your mind with the truth. Like, for example, there's no evidence I will even need the loo or that I won't be able to find one. There's no evidence I will be embarrassed or ashamed. And the truth is, if I treat my thoughts, my worrying thoughts as reality, then the consequences remain dire. I personally like to add a mantra of mine. What would be, will be. I will deal with it if it ever happened. I refuse to worry about something that isn't even happening. And I would do some diaphragmatic breathing to calm down my nervous system, making sure my out-breath, of course, is longer than my in-breath to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and help calm down my mind. And breathing that way is a great way to begin to access your rational mind and use the TACT process or any other CPD process that is for you. Now, here's another model that I teach that I think you might find quite useful. And you can use this for anything, by the way. You don't have to use this with going to the toilet. Same as tact, you can use that for anything to begin to change the way you think and feel about something that can trigger anxiety. So we often get what is known as first wave. And first wave is the instant thought of feeling suggesting that there is an issue. So in this case, there is a toilet problem. And this can come out of absolutely nowhere 
because it can be unconscious. And that's the most infuriating thing about a lot of anxiety. Some people just say, why do I feel anxious without anything on my mind to actually worry about? And that can be part of first wave. So that hot, sweaty feeling, breathing beginning to get faster, the negative thoughts, the behaviors. It's really important with first wave to not resist, do not fight, or try to distract yourself from what you're experiencing because that will increase its intensity. What you resist will persist. Remember, your limbic system, your brain is using your nervous system to hijack you into a form of survival mode. Another mistake is to try and outthink your anxiety, to try to be analytical. It's not going to work, not very often, because your nervous system is hijacking you now. You have to hijack your nervous system back. And what we can do is, whilst we can't change first wave, You can change how it happens in the future by infiltrating how second wave happens. Now, second wave, if left to its own devices, is normally how you respond to first wave. So, for example, if part of first wave you find yourself becoming hot and sweaty and began to imagine yourself struggling to use the bathroom, that is first wave. What might then happen is you might anxiously start looking for a bathroom, rushing around, or think about leaving the situation that you're actually in. So second wave is the interruption. So second wave would be, first of all, doing some double inhale breaths. And if you've never done a double inhale, you breathe in through your nose, To the belly, one, then another one to the chest, two, and then blow everything out through your mouth as long as you can, emptying your lungs. Now, if you're in full anxiety mode, I would suggest doing that six to ten times because it's one of the quickest ways to return your nervous system back to a level of calmness where you can manage your anxiety. It really helps to rebalance your carbon dioxide and oxygen levels too, which can be part of the anxiety process because they become out of balance. Also, breathing down to the belly, to the diaphragm, again, triggers your parasympathetic nervous system. And this re-engages your wonderful, rational, analytical brain, and you can begin to hijack your nervous system back. So second wave. Breathing down to the diaphragm, double inhales, breathe everything in through your nose and then out through your mouth. Yeah. And then begin to label your experience. This is very important. Label your experience as a false alarm. Yeah. You're being tricked into thinking you need the bathroom. You're being tricked into thinking there's going to be a problem. Any future prediction is a trick, especially it's focusing on the worst possible outcome. Keep reminding yourself as you're breathing out that what you're experiencing is a false alarm. If you've ever done any inner child work with myself or with another therapist, you might be reminded that sometimes the anxiety experience has been triggered by our inner child. A part of us from the past, just for simply repeating an outdated program in the present moment. And sometimes just remembering that can be very helpful too. If you'd like to soothe your parasympathetic nervous system a little bit further, you can begin to just rub your arms, your forearms, very gently. If you're in a situation where you won't feel too self-conscious doing that, but it does calm people down. And lastly, Move your attention back to what you're doing. Yeah, fully engage with whatever it is or whoever you're with to the best of your ability. Also, just to add to this, that often when we become anxious, our focus, our gaze 
can literally become very narrow. And it's been shown that you can begin to reduce anxiety by moving your attention so that you begin to take in your whole of your surroundings. So you're expanding your field of vision. Or you could go into peripheral vision if you wish. But expanding your field of vision can also help calm you down. Now, I would practice these techniques in smaller, less intense situations and begin to build yourself up. Because by doing that, you can get more confident in how they work. And then you could begin to move towards situations that cause more anxiety for you. It's important that you do that because avoidance will always be your enemy. It's important to remember that the processes I've gone through today really do work with the mindset. But if you're suffering with anxiety, then obviously this can exacerbate an unhealthy mindset around going to the bathroom. So use my anxiety and stress healing series to work on the bigger picture of why you have anxiety in the first place. You can also do that with a therapist and professional, and that can have a real positive impact on your toilet anxiety as your body heals. And there we have it. If you do struggle with toilet anxiety, I know I've mentioned it a few times in this podcast, please don't suffer any more than you need to. Do reach out to someone or myself for professional help. Do not let anxiety trick you into thinking that it's not worth your time or effort. Very crafty. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I'm truly humbled by how many of you are joining me each week. If you have any topics that you would like me to cover, let me know. Quick thank you to those who have sent emails about my latest meditations and how much you're enjoying them. It's really nice. Thank you very much for that. I'm glad they're resonating with you. If you've not tried the thank you meditation or the letting go meditation, please do let me know your thoughts on those. And I look forward to connecting with you in the next podcast. Please share, please subscribe. If you've not already, please leave me a honest review. Your feedback would be most welcome. More importantly, I hope you have an amazing day.